Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the last session of these two days conference. It's been a pleasure until now, and I think it was a very, very interesting discussion we had before lunch, hopefully also for you, but it's, of course, always interesting if you come from the outside and are supposed to to say something about how it looks outside a country and then when you as a result of that discussion gets an insight into the country that you're visiting I must say it was very very interesting Maria oh, you say Maria you say Maria from Norway hey Norge that's what uh, that's what they say when uh, when Norway are playing football against Denmark, huh? So uh, uh, Maria um, has uh, no hat now, but but she could wear a lot of different hats. Journalist, film director, human rights activist, and also until what is that now? Half a year ago, film consultant at the Norwegian Film Institute. Uh, as you know, the Scandinavian countries have very strong national funding, and uh, all of both Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland have have strong um, funding bodies for for film in general, including documentary film. And Maria was took a, took time off from directing film for four years, was it? as a film consultant uh, at the Norwegian Film Institute. So, Maria, please, here's the mic. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, so happy to be here in uh, St. Petersburg. It's been 15 years since I was here last time. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, he didn't say that I'm actually half Polish also, so I went to the Polish Film Academy, and I was raised on Soviet and Russian films, among others. So uh, that's my background, actually. And 15 years ago, when I was here, I actually did my last 35 millimeter film which was uh, Norwegian-Russian uh, kind of co-production with uh, Len film. Uh, so it was a part of a feature film. So it's even emotional for me to be back here and to see the streets again of St. Petersburg. And I, I find myself to be kind of the last 35 millimeter generation with the sentiment of the 35 millimeter and to feel the image in my hand and how I put it together, the images. <laughs> so I have also gone on this road uh, from the old cinema towards where we are today and I even though being a commission editor for four years and being in the film industry uh, all this time professionally I, I still uh, questioning myself where we're going and uh, the value of the images but I'm still in the business because I profoundly believe in the story in the images telling the story and I also believe in humanity and I'm so naive that I believe in the truth and that we as documentary filmmakers has a mission to do in telling the stories even though it's small or if it's bigger if it's a local story for your community or if it's a global story that you want to spread out to the world so uh, I have prepared for you some notes which I've been scrambling and I don't know if I'm going to understand it myself reading it I have some trailers I'm going to show you with examples from uh, Nordic uh, documentaries for the cinema and also one example of a transmedia project Project, which was a pioneering project in Norway, and to give you updates about where this project is today. But just uh, excuse me when I have to sort of turn the pages here with just one arm available. Uh, for the today's virtual reality and the amount of images and content that we are dealing with is overwhelming and we still don't know where it is heading. 
и мы не знаем до сих пор, куда все это движется. Но мы знаем, что мы все участвуем в этом замечательном путешествии. Мы все участвуем на этом пути. For the last four years, as it was mentioned earlier, I was a film commissioner at the Norwegian Film Institute, and I can give you now just a little clue about how it works. Uh, I thought it was a privilege that I actually had uh, the power uh, and it was also you know, very demanding for me that I had to decide on my own the project that came to me. And I, maybe it's interesting for you to know how it works, the system in Norway. So there would be around 100 projects coming each year. And I had uh, what is uh, around 6 million euro uh, shared together with another consultant. So we had like two and a half, nearly three million euro, each of us, each year, to give out for documentary projects. And this is for documentaries for the cinema, for TV series, for documentary for the film festival, and for the TV, and also transmedia, or documentaries for app. Um, it's um, around 25 documentaries that I could fund during, uh, uh, during the year. Uh, the tendency was very interesting uh, during my work period because when I came to the Film Institute, uh, they tended to support in majority documentaries for TV, a smaller budgets, more money being spread around, and production money at once. But I thought, and this is probably from my more cinematographic Polish background, uh, I wanted to demand more from the storytelling, have a clearer point of view and a tighter narration. So I was starting to give, uh, with purpose, uh, more and more for the development, for the clearer story, and also that the documentarist would work uh, more profoundly and more originally on their story and where they're going to put this story. Uh, so what I'm saying also is the essence. What are you telling to keep it originally, that you know why you're making this, for which audience, uh, and how big is your ambition for your story? Is it for that local TV station? Is it for the Scandinavian market? Is it for the international market? How do you talk with people? How do you communicate? How is your character looking? And what is the message and the story? What, what do you really want to tell? Uh, and, and this was actually very overwhelming for many, I think even majority of Norwegian documentarists, because they were related to the Norwegian TV. It means the Norwegian audience. And the TV TV wanted them only to relate to the Norwegian audience. They didn't want them to tell a universal story because they thought that the Norwegian audience needed the Norwegian sort of glasses uh, to understand the story. And in my opinion, as I look at myself as European, I think that is to underestimate the audience of today because the audience is going global. The audience is not looking anymore with the national hat that they are putting even on me, so I'm going to, I'm going to take this away. I'm a filmmaker. The filmmakers want to make good stories. Basically, that's it. So, more and more development projects were being done, and they were also giving the chance to go out in the European market and to present the project, and they were so surprised. People were interested in the stories. People wanted to hear what they were doing. And they were getting even some very quickly, some a lot of television channels who wanted to go into the project. But what they discovered is that some TVs want the project to go in one direction, another TV channel wants to go it in another direction. The development period was, you know, getting, taking longer and longer time. They needed more money. So we actually found ourselves in a situation where projects were getting better. The st 
story was getting bigger or more concrete, uh, but also it was getting much more costly to make the films. So that is where we are now today and where the, the new commission editors, they have to deal with this now, with very uh, demanding and good projects, but very costly ones. So the reality in Norway is that actually less people can make documentaries because the market is much much tougher, is more professional, and it's related not only to the TV channels but to the international audience. And I think this is also where the transmedia is coming in, though in Norway it's still on a very early level. When it comes to co-production, uh, there has there had been some co-production with the other Nordic countries, but when I started the job, it was very little. Uh, the ones who were more active, were, for example, the Danish with the Swedish, or the Finnish with the Swedish, or the Danish, while the Norway was a little more on the side because they dealt with the Norwegian TV and they didn't really look to their partners in the Nordic countries. Now this is all changing. We're a part of the Nordic co-production, uh, making films with the colleagues. They have made several films together already. They're creating stronger and stronger Nordic teams. And now they're all starting to look for further cooperation with other partners, both in Europe, the US, especially Canada. It's a very attractive market for the Norwegians uh, regarding the Northern dimension. And logically, Russia would also be a very attractive partner. Now, I have to tell you the truth. And this is, yeah, you know what's coming now. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, uh, there is problems for Russian producers to get funding from Norway, from the Institute. Uh, I, have, I have been fighting against it uh, as I could and especially using the example of the excellent filmmakers in Russia, uh, that how is it possible that if the Norwegian filmmakers want to cooperate with them, why they cannot do that? It's still not solved. Uh, but uh, the situation is like this. For co-production, normally, uh, uh, let's say there's a German company, they make a film in uh, partly in uh, France and then in uh, South America. They have to make more than half uh, of the film in Europe. I mean, let's say if they do it in France, they have to do more than half of the film in France for me to be able to support them. And it is the Norwegian co-producer who's applying to the institute, and they are applying with the money that the Norwegian production is taking part in this project. Are you, are you following me? Yeah. Now, so what, what is it about? There is a kind of a protectionism, and now I can say it because I'm not in the institute anymore. Uh, regarding to the EU and EFTA laws, meaning they want to protect uh, European Union filmmakers and the money for the cinema inside European Union. So the filmmaker and the production company also has to be from the European Union, meaning excluding Russia. Now, uh, there are other agreements, uh, so that's called something about uh, the Barnes Corporation in the north. That is a place where you can actually get money from Norway for film production, but it's not the same amount as you would get from the Norwegian Film Institute. Uh, this, this problem with the Russian producer getting money in Norway for their projects, projects uh, is still going on today. It might be that it will change in the future, uh, but it's still not the case. So we, we will see where it's going, and I will keep you updated, if, or if you want to have the information from me, 
if something changed, I will uh, I will let you know about this. I can just give you also one example. A German company uh, co-producing with North Norwegian uh, production company wants to make a film about Russian Sami uh, near Murmansk region, Kola Peninsula. And they are part of Norwegian Sami also. But since the whole story took part in the Kola Peninsula in Russia, it was not possible to support this film, even though I wanted to support it, I could not, I was not allowed to. And even uh, the producer, he complained to the culture ministry, using the example that this is Sami people, which is part of also the Norwegian Sami, but it, it was refused. I can, I can answer you more questions about this later, uh, if you'd like to. But men mentioning now the Sami, uh, partly now my job is to be a mentor at the Sami Film Center. So I, you all are aware of what it means to be a Sami? Yeah, indigenous people of Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Russia. So there, if you are a Russian Sami, you can come with me, to me, with a project, and there is actually a possibility to be funded in the Sami Film Center. Also, I'm now part of something called International Indigenous Circle, and I have just received two large large feature film scripts from Russian indigenous filmmakers. So this is part of the whole indigenous community in the world working uh, towards making their own films. So this is also something going on. And if you're not indigenous, you might want to work with somebody indigenous. <laughs> and, and you might get both me as a mentor or get funding from our Sami uh, film center, which is for all the Sami people in this northern region. Uh, reg regarding the co-production, I don't know how I am with the time, but half a, half a, okay. I thought you said half a minute. <laughs> okay, so I, I wanted to show you now examples of uh, films that I have supported from the Nordic countries, and that would be an excellent way so that you would see also what kind of films is being made in the Nordic countries. Uh, and, of course, this is a sample. There are many other also good films, and maybe, God knows, maybe even better. But these are the ones that I was lucky uh, to support and which I put in the trailer. There are still others I supported, but these are some examples. So the first film uh, is a Swedish uh, documentary called Freak Out. It's in production still. Actually, they were at Nordic Panorama now to, with their with the project, uh, and I think they will have it finished soon. It's a fascinating story about the first hippie movement in Switzerland. Very, very nice historic uh, artistic uh, movie. The second one uh, is a Norwegian documentary called Pushwagner about a crazy painter named Pushwagner, uh, who's like a pop artist and uh, I mean, he's, he's making happenings, and you'll, you'll see him, and then you'll understand uh, this crazy story. Very popular in Norway, in the cinemas. Then it's a Finnish documentary called Punk Syndrome, about uh, a special punk group from Finland, being very special, and you'll soon see why. They're also being very successful now after the movie, becoming pop stars, and they're very funny. Uh, then is a documentary from Denmark called Law of the Jungle. This is a social, critical, human rights uh, uh, documentary about indigenous people in the Amazons being exploited by uh, a Dutch oil company. Uh, and the last film, 
very beautiful film which screened in the cinemas in Sweden a year ago, Harbor of Hope. Uh, and this is also a film which now is looking actually post their production, but now they're looking into creating a transmedia. It's the story about survivors of Holocaust, the Jews, who came to Sweden after the concentration camp, and the film is based on the materials from when they arrived to Sweden. And it's it's very chilling and a very strong uh, story. And what happened when the film was finished, and they went around I mean, on international festivals, but it was invited to the Holocaust Center in uh, Washington, to the Israel, etc., everywhere they were going. People recognized themselves and relatives. So suddenly the story is just growing, and the documentation of the victims or the family is growing, and they are suddenly sitting with responsibility. What are we going to do with this? Because this is history. And we, we are filmmakers, but we are also the ones bearing this story and having the responsibility. Are we going to throw it in the garbage? Or are we going to keep this as a legacy? And I think that's one of the reasons also of the importance of uh, transmedia, to use it in this way, just like Farewell Comrades has been used to, that I also was fortunate to, to finance, actually, uh, or part finance. So I'll, I'll give you now the... Uh, the films and I hope the light goes off and we get the sound. Do we have a sound? You know, back in those days for us the world was pretty much like today. Globalization, raw capitalism, fast communication span of the world. I just wanted to get out. Oh, you want to see more of that? <laughs> <laughs> you will. <laughs>
Yeah, so you got that's what I had time for. But I think what's, what's sorry. I think what's uh, important in all these films is passion, it's the desire to show and to be alive. It's a little rock and roll, but it's, you know, you got the energy and it's pulsating and the wish to tell the story and to share it with the audience. I think that's, that's the important drive. Uh, now, since I have so little time, I'll jump to uh, also this transmedia project, uh, which were the one first one I have supported and followed until today. Uh, they started to get uh, project funding in, 9, 000, uh, in 2010 uh, and they are now about to finish the film. Uh, it has costed them 5 million kroner, which is, uh, which is uh, 900,000 US dollars. It has taken them double the time than if they were only making a documentary film uh, and of course double the money also. And I think, you know, ju just this simple example will tell you, you know, the difference between just making a documentary film with your little web page or to really to merge into the uh, transmedia. And if you, if you write it down, I mean, you can look it up on your own, uh, www.projectmocken.com. Uh, what I like about this project is that it's, it's very... And I wouldn't say that it's very simple, but it's very clear that all the different components to the film. So it's a film about the sea nomads in Burma, Thailand. The main, it's a character-driven story. The main character wants to make a, a, a traditional boat, but they're not allowed to uh, cut any trees anymore because it's a national park. So one of the, the transmedia parts here is something called the tree campaign, which where they want to activate the people uh, to be aware of the situation of this group of people. Uh, so for the moment for this one you can see it's 300 people, are, no, 900 people are taking part in this. But you can put in your name, you can be part of this, but all, you know, going into all these different components, yeah, it's just going to grow up here. So you, you have to look up at this on your own. Uh, for them to go into this transmedia project, because they were ordinary filmmakers, they had to go together with commercial uh, experts, with people who are working with uh, game, game in the in the in the web design, etc., etc. So they had to sort of think completely new in the way of making movies. Uh, so this is the essence. So you have here the documentary, you have a campaign. They're joining human rights organizations like Survival International to get the... Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, then they have uh, an application, uh, an app for the mobile phone, which is quite funny, where... Uh, I'm not going to do it now, but it's, it's called Hold Your Breath. So you can sort of test uh, if you are as able as the Mokken people to dive, because that's one of the things they are very good in. They are of the best in the world to dive without breathing uh, for quite a long time. So you, come, you can compare yourself with them. Then there is the other aspect, and this is also for them, uh, the filmmakers, it was the way to, to get the Norwegian audience and financement, because Norway is genuinely uh, interested in uh, boats and the sea and the fishing. So you get the people interested in the marina life, you get the people who are interested in boat building, about exploration of uh, you know, faraway places. So this is about also in the transmedia sense, how to find your audience and to sort of looking and targeting exactly this kind of audience uh, who can relate to your film. And when you have them hooked on, then later you can, you can broaden it to a larger uh, group of people and a larger group of audience. So they have these this different uh, parts of the story. 
and of course the extra movie footage and the documentary uh, in itself about these people. And, and the sense is also that the Moccan people are going to take over this project later because this is also one part which is quite tricky if you're not a big production company with a lot of income coming in. How do you keep the transmedia project going on after you used up the money you got for the financement of this? So, uh, related to this kind of topics, working, for example, with a humanitarian or a human rights organization, they can later fund to keep the page going and also to activate or to get the jobs to those people who are the characters or part of that group of people who are in the movie so that they will take over themselves this story and continuing it and even it will create jobs for these people. So you have to think on the long run, not only when you're making the film, you're getting a budget, but how are you going to keep this page up? because transmedia is the interactive. So you will always get the audience communicating with you and you have to be a webmaster communicating back and it's actually very expensive to keep this going. So this is part of doing the transmedia who is going to pay for this later and who are you going to involve in this project. Okay, I think I, I used up my time, so maybe I'm going to take uh, questions now. Yes? Is there anyone who wants to ask me something about Nordic fundings or uh, something I didn't touch upon yet? Mm, no. <laughs> Maybe one thing that's you, you touched upon it, uh, uh, but very briefly, and I think it's it's important to underline that the way the Nordic system works is that it's an individual. You said that, but, uh, but, yeah. but, but in, in a lot of other countries, we're used to committees mm. who are deciding, which very often means that compromises are made, and then these. Uh, different films like Push Wagner, you know, uh, they, they don't get funded. And that's one of the key elements of, of the Nordic funding system, that, that it's, it's a film consultant like you who decides what film should be supported. And I, I promise you that te television they tried and they made pressure and they were used to getting a lot of our money and they were really pissed with me because they thought that we would pay for the ordinary Norwegian documentaries that they were had in their slots. But when this changed, they first didn't want to pay anything or to have with any films to do. And now they have changed again. So they have actually picked up a couple of production companies they want to work with and they tell them what they should do. And they don't think that we are probably going to support many of their guarantee that we will support it so they know it's a change, changing way so we actually end up and I think it's the same story in all the Nordic countries, at least Sweden and Finland that we have to pay up to uh, two thirds of the budgets of the documentaries that we decide to support because the TV is hardly going to pay they, they hardly co-produce anymore they do the pre-buy uh, and pay as little as possible. So that's why we also are dependent in cooperating with the other countries and find our partners abroad and to make the bigger global story. And I forgot another thing. Because when I started the job, it was everything was very centralized in Oslo. The national funds where I was, we decide, I decide. Yeah. Uh, but and I, I remember that some of my colleagues were saying, you know, when they come in application from the, the regions, like let's say Tromsø, not of Norway, and they would say, but that's not a professional company. We have to support the big major companies in Oslo, in the capital. But I said, but I'm looking at the best story. Give me the best story, and if I believe the company can make this story, I'm going to support it. I'm not looking at the name, what is the name of this producer. I'm not looking, uh, you know, first of all of his credential I'm looking also as much on the good story 
такого качества саморабота. And I don't know why they didn't necessarily give me the best stories, but no, I ended up actually funded more than half of my projects was from the regions in Norway and not from Oslo. And the last year, when I was in the institute, two-thirds of the project I supported was from the region and not from Oslo. And actually the other consultants were also increasingly giving more to the region, and the region was stronger. And, by coincidence, in the same time, uh, the culture ministry in Norway were also aware of, it, it, it was the opposite way because they thought the region are not going to get a lot of money from the institute, so we're going to make regions stronger and give them money so that they can support the regional films. But instead what happened was that the regional directors and producers were getting stronger and now they were getting money both from me, for example, and from the regional fund. So they were actually more able in the end to do the movies because they got from the regional fund and they got from us because they made the best stories and they were more eager to tell their story. And I thought that was just brilliant because it's not about the power, it's not about the money, it's about freedom, it's about the artistic expression and the willingness you have to make a story and that you're burning to make that story. So now in Norway this is what's going on. It's the region which is coming vibrantly alive. And I'm happy of that, actually. <laughs> But of course that funding system with one individual deciding only works if it's based on a high integrity on that individual. And I think that's important to mention. I've, I've made quite a few in some of the, the Eastern European countries who said it wouldn't work in our country because you don't have the integrity of the individual. Um, yeah. Any questions to yes. Maria? Yes. Because you, you said that the, you made the impression that uh, the system is quite provincial, you can say. You have to be Norwegian, etc. Et but, yeah. Yeah. but mm -hmm. looking at a lot of, of project films coming out of Norway, I see foreign directors making an alliance with Norwegian companies and getting money in Norway. Th that's Piraya film. Piraya film, yeah. Why can they do it? And that's that's that one, yeah, because so there are very few Norwegian companies yeah. who actually have a very good international co-production uh, sort of CV. So I'm just Piraya saying. is very unique and they specialize in working with foreign uh, uh, directors. And I supported the first year before they made this culture ban only to give money f to European Union countries, they made a production with Andre Nekrasov called, yeah, uh, and I supported that film. At that time he was a Russian citizen. Now he's actually a Norwegian citizen. Uh, so he's not a Russian anymore. So it is actually... Yeah, it so is he, Maya. He, he, it he is can, possible. He can is. still get money from Norway because now he's a Norwegian. Yeah, but so. it is possible for people here, if they want, and they can go and, and, and get a connection to Piraya film or some other. No, no. Uh, no not the Russian director. Because what they have to do, yeah. for example, Piraya have done then this thing. Piraya is, is a Norwegian production company. Right. Yeah. So, for example, uh, Nishta Jane, who made Gulabi Gang, that I supported, that could be possible because the Piraya producer co-directed it with Nishta. And then when the Norwegian are the authors and the directors, then you can actually make a film outside Europe. Yeah. So the, the, there are four rules. You have to fill three of them. First, it has to be a Norwegian manuscript, a Norwegian idea. Yeah. Then Secondly, it has to be about Norwegian culture and history and society. Number three, it has to take place in Norway or European Union. Uh, and number four, the majority have to be Norwegian people to, or they have to have significant roles in the production. So it's a tricky one. But the good thing, as you mentioned, for co-productions, this system is probably going to uh, will not exist anymore in Norway, 
They're changing it for co-productions. That's what they're saying. And they're saying and that if and and mm-hmm. it doesn't go for Norway, uh, for Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. So yes. this is a particularly Norwegian thing. Yeah. So it's not a, it's In not the a other Scandinavian. Countries it's okay. Yeah. Now the, what the, what they wanted to change it into, which hasn't happened yet, is that if Germany says it's a German culture product, then Norway will accept what Germany decides. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's supported by a national fund in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything more? Otherwise, we will I'm still go here. to uh, yeah. Mr. Libergal. Is that correct, Mr. Müller? Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria.